Hello my friends and welcome back and you know what day it is, I don't even have to say it, alright I say it for your sake, it's hump day, it's Wednesday my dudes, which means half of the week is done, so we are ready to survive the other half of the week. But you know, surviving might be quite difficult for Mr. Bodan of the head of the Ukrainian intelligence. I'm just kidding. If Russians would have the capability to do anything to him, they would have already done it. I didn't do fucking shit! They have been trying for the last two years and ha it hasn't been working out for them. But that doesn't stop the head of the Russian FSB publicly saying that their next target is Budanov. Well, it's just talk because they haven't been able to do nothing, but let's watch the video anyway. Are Budanov and the leadership of the Ukrainian intelligence services our legitimate targets? Everyone who commits crimes against Russia and Russian citizens is a legitimate target. And this dude, by the way, is the head of the Russian FSB. He doesn't really come out publicly in front of the cameras, but at this case, cameras were just in front of him. He was trying to escape and they were asking questions, so he had to answer. And why are they still alive? Everything is ahead. So why is Budanov still alive? As supposedly the biggest enemy of the Russian Federation and the guy says everything is still ahead. Well, they have tried. And you know, they failed many, many, many times. There's many stories about it. So they tried to poison his wife. Yes, Budanov's wife. His wife survived and they knew it was the Russian FSB who did the poisoning. So now Budanov is pissed off and... That's why we see the burning Russian oil refineries, we see Russian ships being turned into submarines, we see all of that destruction in Belgorod because they pissed off Budanov. So if I was that dude head of the Russian FSB, I would think twice before making threats. This guy here can disappear. My friends, how are the Ukrainians so damn effective in shooting down Shahed drones? Russians are launching Shaheds every day, 10 plus daily. Some days it's like 100 Shaheds, 70 Shaheds. Ukrainians are shooting down 90% of them. How is this possible? They're mostly flying at night. Okay, they're slow and loud, but still you gotta hit them with bullets to shoot them down. Ukraine is vast, huge. How are they able to do so if they fly so unpredictably? Well, the answer is plain and right here in this video. This is General James B. Hecker, commander of the United States Air Force in Europe, and he has... The, in the most simplest terms, the truth about the Ukrainian capability to shoot down Shahids. Let's watch it together. The Ukrainians grabbed 8,000 cell phones and they put them on six-foot pole. And they put them all around Ukraine and they put a microphone like this next to it. So they could hear one-way UAVs coming overhead. It cost $500. So simple cell phones, always connected to electric circuit, meaning the battery doesn't go out, and the microphone is in the cell phone or right next to it, always connected to the SIM card in the cell phone, always recording sound. And since Shahads, you don't even need a radar to detect them. Why? Because they make such a loud noise and a very recognizable noise. Whichever AI you're using, you can just train it by feeding samples to it that this is a Shahed noise, this is its noise in the rainy weather, this is its noise in the windy weather, this is its noise at, at night and at day. It will recognize it and immediately pinpoint locate that cell phone tower, that microphone, and when the noise is uh, somewhere near it and the other cell phone, it already triangulates the position, so Ukrainians know this was the triangulated position five minutes ago, this was three minutes ago, okay, it's moving this way, Send the crews to that location, we're gonna intercept it. It's genius and it's cheap and I damn love it. They're able to get headings, they're able to get velocity of these things. Not only were they cheap to produce, but General Hacker says that they could share that information with some 200 mobile units using AAA or anti-aircraft artillery. And they train a guy for six hours to sit in an anti-aircraft artillery and look at an iPad. That would show them where the UAVs were coming in. They had 84 of them uh, that came in the other day. They tracked all 84, they shot down 80 of them, which is over 90% of interception rate. And this is insane, and the information doesn't stop there. Because, well, we 
you all know Shahids are made in Russia in one factory and mostly made in Iran. Now they are very mass producible and relatively cheap. They cost without, let's take all the procurement money and corruption, everything out of it, the cheap, that's just the basic Shahid from Iran costs about forty to $50,000. But the thing is, with Russia, any Russian procurement officer in the military takes a huge percentage, about a third of the entire money to himself, and then two-thirds goes to buy the drone. So that drives the Shahid drone cost up to 100000 But the Ukrainian interception rate is uh, over 90%, which drive Shah the successful Shahed hit up to 10 times because 90%, 10% hit times 10. That means one successful Shahed hit costs Russian $1 million. About such a cheap and mass producible drone, you still have to pay $1 million to successfully hit. That's the statistics. Simply because Ukrainians are able to do this. Use their cell phones and, and microphones on towers, always connected to circuit network and, electro uh, and uh, SIM card GSM. They can locate them, triangulate the positions and move the anti-aircraft artillery into right positions to shoot them down. This is insane. This costs, this drives the Russian war costs up 10 times immediately with cheap phones and cheap That's microphones. Wow, beautiful, прекрасно, saibis. That's on the right side of the cost curve as op opposed to shooting them down with Patriots and SM-2 missiles. Very correct. Even if Shahed goes through the last AAA fire and it's reaching a city, using a Patriot to shoot it down is just... It's, it's, it's not even on the same scale of the cost effectiveness. Like, it's, it's pointless. Now, my friends, in the last month there has been a huge information operation from the Ukrainian side that the Russian Volunteer Corps has been doing stuff in Belgorod region. They have liberated three villages and I've, I've said many times before it's not there to liberate that territory or occupy that territory long term simply because they don't have enough men. That's the hard facts of it. It's a battalion. But it's really, really hurtful for the Russian image and the Russian image of we can defend ourselves against foreign threats because they can't. Belgorod is a Russian Federation area which the Russian Volunteer Corps was simply able to drive into and push out everybody who were in that area. Now Russians are trying to push in their own narrative, push back with the informational warfare. Russian media channels yesterday started claiming that Russia is planning to occupy or take Kharkiv. They're trying to take Kharkiv, a city of almost two million people, second biggest city in Ukraine, close to Russian border on the northern eastern front. Now they tried to do that at the beginning months of war, like they tried to take Kiev. I mean, taking that city, let me tell you, whatever the Russian channels say, whatever the presidents or Medvedev, whoever says it, this hardcore facts that you look at the satellite photos is taking Kharkiv, a city of 2 million, almost 2 million people, requires a hell load of men and equipment. It requires, I, I will say it right now, it requires every last man that Russia has in Ukraine right now, which is over 500,000 men. Half a million men you need to take that city because every Ukrainian citizen in that city of Kharkiv will be mobilized against that act attack, which results up to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of weaponized civilians, in addition to the army fighting against that. So there is no way in hell Russia will ever take Kharkiv. That's my prediction. My friends, we began with the Russian head of the FSB threatening Budanov, but now I have a story from Budanov, which is not only threats, but an actual reality, because Ukrainians destroyed yet another Russian Black Sea fleet, Ropucha-class landing ship Konstantin Alshansky, with their domestically developed anti-ship missile Neptune. Yes, Ukrainians have actually built their own anti-ship missile. They don't have to buy it from the Western countries because they can produce their own. <laughs> that, that, that's what they do. It's like, oh, weapons in the West? Oh, weapons in the East? Oh, we're gonna build our own. The ship was left to the Ukrainian Navy after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but was taken over by the Russian Black Sea Fleet during an annexation of Crimea in 2014. So it was a Ukrainian ship. 
at the beginning, and then it was a Russian ship, and now it's <laughs> it's a SpongeBob ship at the bottom under the sea, you know. According to the Ukrainian Navy, Russia had started renovating it a year ago to make it operational again, and therefore it had to be destroyed. It is likely that this attack was carried out during an air raid conducted two days ago. According to known information, Ukrainian Neptune-class missiles should not be able to reach targets in the southern part of the Crimea from Ukrainian controlled territory. It is possible that Ukraine has been able to significantly modernize their Neptune anti-ship missiles. Again, Ukrainian ingenuity, it's beautiful. They can do almost anything very cheaply, which is very necessary in war. Also, my friends, on these satellite photos, we can also see that two days ago, the big storm shadow attack against Sevastopol and Crimea, which took away uh, the Black Sea Fleet communication headquarters in Crimea, big, got a beam, but a boom. That attack also damaged, as we can see from these satellite photos, the Russian reconnaissance ship Ivan Kurus. This was damaged before already by Ukrainians, and now it's damaged again. This ship doesn't want to sink, but it takes a lot of damage. I don't think it will return to battle or even any kind of deployment of, for the duration of this war. Like Ukraine is not able to do much against Russian glide bombs, Russia is not able to do almost anything against Ukrainian drones and missiles that hit their Black Sea fleet. Black Sea fleet will be sunk by the end of the 2024 with this rate things are going. Russia will have a huge submarine fleet in the Black Sea but they will not have any surface vessels, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> now, my friends, I'll bring you a video from Russia, from Belgorod, because tonight, all night, Ukrainians were hammering it or pounding it, whichever inappropriate word you want to use for it, penetrating deep into the Belgorod's rear areas. Yes, this is Russian anti-aircraft fire and Ukrainian drones and missiles raining down on that city. What I want to bring to you is the guy who's filming that, because it's a surprise. I'm not going to say anything. Let's watch it. Uh, let's see if you notice it. Whoa. Wow, 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 wow. Very nice. Wow. Great success. Major uh, attack on the city of Belgrade. Russia right now, you can hear rockets coming in, anti-air rockets, engaging the rockets. We're directly in the center of the city right now. Yeah, I mean... You all got it. This is an American. I don't know if he's American or not, but he speaks exactly like an American. This is an American Midwest accent, if I'm not mistaken. It's American. So, living in Belgorod, possibly has a Russian wife or whatever he's doing there. If you know, put it in the comments, because right now, for an American to live in Russia, not very nice. Not great success. So, what is he doing there? What's his story? I'm sure one of you knows. Is he CIA? Put it in the comments. My friends, now I'll read you a report of what's going on between Russia and North Korea. For the last six months, North Korea has given to Russia about three million artillery shells, which is an, an enormous amount of shells, like too much. Just, it's, it's not fair in this war. Luckily, Ukraine has Czech country and their led initiative, especially the Chad, Giga Chad president, Petr Pavel, has somehow conjured 1.5 million shells for Ukraine with the Western countries' aid and most of the countries have joined, joined that coalition. But North Korea and Russia, we know North Korea has given Russia so much of the shells. What has Russia given back? Well, the reports have been that they have given back weapons technology, microchips, everything that North Korea cannot get. And even China won't sell them these things because they also want to keep them in check. But Russia will give them that. But that's not it. Now we have empirical reports. At least five North Korean tankers have left the port of Vostochny in Russian Far East in this month with oil products, according to the satellite images provided to the Financial Times by Royal United States Service 
Institute. These oil deliveries constitute a full frontal assault against the sanctions regime, which is now on the brink of collapse, said Hugh Griffiths. Thing is, Russia is giving crude oil and some refined oil products to North Korea and they're getting in return munitions. All of this is really bad for Ukraine and the West and all of this is really good for North Korea and Russia both. Russia gets a hell lot of munitions, they can use it according to their favorite doctrine, which is just saturate everything with explosions, bada bim, bada boom, and send in the meat. That's what they do. And North Korea, well, they just need the oil because they don't have anything. They're lacking everything in that country. Everything you see around you right now in the West, everything, they are lacking. So whatever Russia sends, it's necessary for them. So unfortunately, they both gain immensely from this deal, symbiosis. And Ukraine is not gaining so much losing. But luckily, I I'm glad. Petro Pavel, Czech president, thank you for existing. Thank you for conjuring 1.5 million artillery shells from all across the world for Ukraine. That makes a hell of a difference. If those shells start reaching Ukraine, then the artillery rate of fire for the Ukrainian units will be increased five to six times and that would be enough for the next almost a whole year for Ukraine to just, just destroy Russian meat. Beautiful. My friends, look at this photo. This is a Ukrainian kamikaze drone homing into a Russian tank. Oh, but it's not a tank. I wouldn't usually show these photos. Ah, it's a tank infantry fighting vehicle. Who cares? It's gonna be destroyed. But this one, if I'm gonna say to you right now, only five of these were ever built in the Soviet Union and they're not meant for infantry or any kind of troops. They are meant for the Soviet leadership in the case of the nuclear fallout or nuclear winter. Check this out. This is called Ladoga. Ladoga is a lake in Russia and it's a Soviet-made Ladoga infantry firing vehicle on a T-80 chassis. Now this is not meant for fighting. It's meant for... Check this out. This is the inside. It's meant for uh, controlling, communicating, it, it's a leadership recall, it's not re a leadership communication vehicle in the 80s for nuclear fallout. And they sent it, I mean, what else is Putin going to do? He has his own bunkers and his aircraft, doesn't need that vehicle. Of course, he's going to send it just as meat, as metal, uh, to soak up Ukrainian ammunition, but it's very rare. And here we have an informational page about the Ladaga, cool photos about it. Only about five of them were ever built. Imagine being inside here, your Brezhnev, for example, who under his leadership this was made, and he's looking at this tiny TV playing Tetris, and nuclear bombs going off all over the place, you're playing, playing Pac-Man or Tetris or Street Fighter here, and enjoying your Soviet Pepsi Cola. Yeah, because Pepsi was really big at the Soviet Union at that time. This is such a going back in history, very cool. And only about uh, four to five of such machines were was ever built. So to notice one in Ukraine by an FPV, I mean, that's an honor for the FPV operator to take down that specific vehicle. And now my friends, my friends, I'll bring you Joni Askola, the NAFO guy from Finland, who is very good OSINT analyst. And he will speak to us about France, because France is really stepping up. I really like the way the French are going connected to Russo-Ukrainian war. I don't know what they're doing internally with their country, not my problem, but the fact that they are now, Macron is speaking about escalating with Russia and showing force, and now we're seeing steps. I'll read you the report. It's beautiful. The French Minister of Defense, Sebastien Le Carnu, I don't know, Sebastien Le Carnu, held a press conference yesterday where he gave more details about French production and military aid for the year. This year, France is planning to producing and delivering 600 hammer glide bombs. Yeah, I've said it many times. Russia has a lot of glide bombs. They're able to mass produce them and they have uh, wing kits, guidance kits that are relatively cheap to make. They can make them all internally and Ukraine doesn't have any antidote do it, to it. The only antidote would be the F-16 and to make their own glide bombs, which they're now slowly starting to do. But at the meantime, the French are stepping in saying, uh, how is please in France, French? They are saying that, uh, take my uh, glide bombs, take it. Oh. I don't know how to do French accent. Of which 100 will be delivered to Ukraine this month. France is also planning to double their hammer production. <laughs> 
hammer, yeah, to, to 1,200 in 2025. These have already been integrated to Ukrainian MiG-29 jets, and France is planning to in, is planning on integration. In, France is planning on integrating them to F-16 jets as well. As we've discussed before, glide bombs are one of the Russian defense industry's few successes in this war. Ukraine is luckily slowly catching up on them with hammer and JDAM glide bombs, but also ground launch small diameter bombs. GLSDB from Saab. That is not it. There are more details and French are now saying that they will follow through with their promises with these steps. There are many steps and bullet points. Just this is what we're going to do by 25. This is what we're going to do by the end of this year. I like this attitude. That's our goal. That's our detailed plan of action. Let's go. Let's pummel through it. Ukraine for the victory. I would have never guessed I will find that attitude in the French leadership. But I did. Vive la France. What, I, what else can I say? My friends, now my favorite part of the video, which will again be part of every video because it's Buy Me A Coffee members, the guys who give me stability and, and security while making these videos. I'll be butchering you the members' names. Get ready. Björn, Jochni, Jot, Jonas, Jot R, Kraham Tchom, Greg, David Purgescu, Jonathan, Radvals, E.B., Paul Workman, Jut B. Thank you to each and every one of these members. If you like my channel, then become a monthly member and I'll be butchering your name to oblivion. Until my next video, my friends, which is tomorrow, press the subscribe button and press the bell notification button also, otherwise you just won't get the notification of the video coming out. And Slava Ukraini and bye-bye.